Hi, this video is about this tweet from Satya Nadella, the CEO of OpenAI, where he basically throws OpenAI under the bus to some degree, at least if you kind of take the logic from one step to the other, and says that they're potentially not viable long term. So let's uh, pick this apart a little bit, uh, bit by bit. So as AI becomes more capable and, and agentic, we'll cover agentic in a little bit, but as they become more capable, models themselves become more of a commodity. I would suggest that it has more to do with as um, as open source models uh, cover larger and larger percentages of the use case space, then um, the models themselves do become commoditized. Um, and then all the value gets created by how you steer ground and fine tune these models. Uh, to me, this is, I don't know if I would say all the value, but the majority of the value becomes uh, set by AI engineers, essentially. Not the people who build the models, but the people that know how to use them and leverage them a as tools. And we'll dig a little bit into into that. Now, I would I would disagree with the, the rest of what, what he has to say here, which is uh, has to do with uh, the UI layer, because th this right here is uh, his sales pitch for Copilot, which to me is uh, only unlocks a very small percentage of the, the solution space. And again, I'm gonna cover that in this video as well. So let's talk about LLM commoditization. So Llama 3 covers more use cases, more usefulness than um, Llama 2 did, and Llama 4, expected to come out later this year, um, covers should cover even more. And as we get deeper and deeper into big open source models, um, <clears throat> they cover a larger and larger set of use cases. And um, this means that you don't need the cutting edge models nearly as much. Um, as time goes on. So let's think about this in terms of like intelligence thresholds. <laughs> My dog's playing with a squeaky toy. Um, the, it, the, if you think about all the jobs that are out there in existence, there are certain thresholds of intelligence that are needed for them. And you don't always need the most intelligent person in the world to do an intellectual job. The same is true for LLMs. And I think this is one of the key factors that put into question the viability of the LLM, the comp companies that are focused primarily on building LLMs. On top of the fact that LLMs are extremely expensive to build, um, it's not just that they are, that, that, that they might be kind of pushed out to a significant degree by other models, it's also kind of the cost benefit ratio that you get from, uh, from the, these, these models. These, the models degrade at a very high rate they are extremely expensive, uh, and this to me would be, if I was an investor in uh, OpenAI, I'd be very concerned about, about their viability long-term as a business. Um, so let's talk about controlling LLMs, because this is where I, I agree, where he, he's maybe not all the value, but again, the majority of the value, which I'll cover in this uh, section here, where you steer, ground, and fine tune, and there's more to it than that. Uh, basically, AI engineering. AI engineering is where the value of the LMs is really going to come from. How to use these as tools, and this has been my focus and our focus as a company for about a year and a half now. And to me, it's been really obvious that this is really important and probably more important than building the LMs themselves. I think it, it's one of the things you need people to build the LMs in order to, for AI engineering to exist. But once they're built and once they're out there, the actual how do you leverage them becomes more important. There is some overlap in skills, so let's say fine tune is a little bit of a gray area. Like the more, the bigger the fine tune, the more it's kind of ML, and the smaller the fine tune, which you can do pretty, really great stuff with very small fine tunes. The more I would say it's kind of AI engineering, uh, but it, it's still a little bit of an overlap. And the distinct massive lack of focus on how to control LLMs because virtually all of the investment and time and energy and resources have gone into how to build in, into building LLMs is the reason why so many people are struggling with agents and this is how you build good agents by understanding how to control them instead of thinking about agents from a very LLM centric focus which is what OpenAI and most companies are doing. Um, I'm going to make a separate video on agents. Um, uh, St. Maltman recently made a post about their goal three, which is like, oh, we needed to do basically what O1 did, Strawberry, in order to be able to build agents. And my response to that is, no, you could build really excellent agents with GPT-4 and the current and the current models right now before O1. O1 helps you build agents, but it, only if you built if you're thinking about it from a very LLM-centric standpoint. Uh, L, uh, O1 is the first 
it, like kind of public step into AI engineering that at, le that at least from the surface on the surface that uh, OpenAI has done. So far, all they've done is basically models, 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 and they've been a model company. O1 is not just a model, it is actually a process and an algorithm to a, a significant degree. And I would suggest that if OpenAI continues to be an LLM model-centric company, that that reduces their chances of being a viable company. On the other hand, if they go deeper down the AI engineering path and they start to leverage models, work very heavily on how to leverage models, then I think they will have more success faster with agents and they'll be able to potentially reach their AGI goals or at least become a more viable company. So let's talk about um, how most people are viewing using uh, LLMs versus how to actually get the real value out of it. So most of the stuff that I see out there, and this is why part of why the evals don't really tell you a whole lot um, and, and why a lot of the common uh, thought thoughts out there are very far off in terms of what the capabilities of LLMs are and how to really use them is they're viewing it from a very chatbot perspective usage, which is basically what Copilot is. Copilot is a little bit more, but it's basically just a chatbot versus actually thinking about them as building, using them as tools within AI powered software to solve problems you couldn't solve before. This is where 99 plus percent of the, of the value comes from. And this is where AI engineering is really critical. What we have found and with regards to R and D and working with clients is that when you build an AI powered solution, it is not anywhere near a hundred percent the LLM that you don't lean on the LLM for the whole solution. In fact, oftentimes it is about a third, somewhere in the range of a quarter to 50%, roughly about a third of the solution ends up being the LLM itself. And the rest of it is actually writing new code that works with the LLMs, that preps and the, the data or that splits the solution apart into smaller pieces and then deals with the, the output of the data. Um, and, but yet at the same time, the chatbot focus is basically what the world is focusing on. Even you know, made a lot of the major nerds out there that are software developers, they're thinking about this in terms of, oh, I can code with it. They're not thinking about very much, or I see very, very little content on how to leverage elements within a solution. How do you deal with the randomness that is now uh, inside your software that wasn't there before? This is a major consideration. And I can't tell how many companies I've talked to where they think, where they think that they have checked the AI box by getting Copilot. And I get it. Microsoft is very trusted. They're a great company. They help a lot of businesses, and they're pimping this as a uh, as like you can solve your AI. You can get the value out of AI you want with Copilot. It's not true. I, I, I guarantee you, there's just so much you're missing if all if your answer to using AI is Copilot. I do think this will become more obvious as time goes on. And uh, even though it might sound kind of crazy right now, um, and most people, there's still a lot of value in, there's still a lot of value in this 1%. So this 1% is still significant. And so when people see that, I think they see, wow, that's so awesome what we could do with it. And they don't realize the massive uh, value that is hiding behind the curtain. But uh, the, the, you know, the, the handful of nerds that I've talked to who are actually building real world powered software, they totally get this. They totally understand and they agree with a lot of my points that are in, in this video and in other videos. And so I think this will become more obvious. It's just is, uh, it's pretty pervasive, this chatbot focus. Uh, the big companies like OpenAI and other companies are invested in, and even Microsoft and Google, they have a major uh, interest in us thinking about it as a chatbot to sell the models as the solutions, to sell it as, hey, GPT-5, GPT-7 or whatever will solve what you need it to solve. While uh, there is, in our R&D and with working with clients, there, that is a very unreasonable expectation. So if you'd like some help uh, implementing AI at your organization, we can build a free custom AI implementation roadmap for you. Give us a call or click the link below. If you like uh, dog squeaky toys or, uh, or, the, or the, this, the content in this video, please uh, give a thumbs up and subscribe. Um, if you have any comments on this, happy to discuss with this. If you disagree with me on any of these, please put your comments below. Happy to chat with you. Or if you agree, I'd, I'd like to hear from you too as well. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye.